Okay, welcome, welcome everyone to the Eternal Spoiler Breakdown. We have two new spoilers for today, uh, one of which is Hailstorm. And so we're going to talk about those. They are some interesting cards that we are going to be seeing, but Hailstorm is probably the most impactful of the two that were spoiled today. So uh, Hailstorm is three cost, two blue, and deal three damage to each unit. So it is a lightning storm at one extra cost and one extra influence in Primal. This is a very powerful card. Uh, it is... Uh, gonna be a primal staple I would say it's actually quite good and uh, does a lot of things that lightning storm really wants to be doing but isn't doing quite well enough uh, this is the big sweeper that actually knocks down aggro decks uh, kills things like unseen commando and whirling duo which have been very very dominant for a while and uh, sort of messes with Rakano type strategies which have traditionally always been the bane of primal decks everywhere I think more than any other card that has been released like on its own this is is a card that improves the position of Primal as a faction uh, in comparison to basically anything else that you could release. Like, this is the kind of thing that you actually really, really want to make mono primal decks, to make decks that are primal primary, and to just try to actually play around with those archetypes. Traditionally, primal does not have a lot of strong unit cards, so it needs very powerful spells that can actually sort of stabilize it in the early game. And right now it's been relying on cards like Permafrost, Lightning Strike, and Lightning Storm, all of which are very, very well-designed cards with very, very specific weaknesses that aren't well covered against sort of Rakano style decks. So it has a lot of issues with endurance units, and endurance units are very, very popular. And basically, like, it just gets into a situation where Primal has not been the strongest faction for a very long time. It's always been sort of mildly underplayed. Like, you will definitely see it on equal... I I'm sure that the stats would show it on equal win rate with most of the other factions, but uh, most of the time people are not playing, like, sort of a Primal facing strategy. They are playing a deck with primal cards to support. And primal being the support faction is an okay identity, but I'm certainly looking for more spell-based stuff, more interesting sort of primal ideas, and I think that Hailstorm is something that helps you to actually get into all of the interesting primal cards and play around with their guts. So if you want to play stuff like uh, Pearlescent Drake and uh, Torgoth, Icecap Trader, and the uh, Geral Iceheart, and like, there's all these cool, cool strategies that we played around with that are actually really, really interesting and fun. But uh, like, basically, there's just something missing in getting them set up. So this is one of those cards that actually really, really helps with that situation. Um, so overall, like in terms of meta improvements, I think this is a really, really big deal and uh, is going to be just a fantastic primal card uh, for just about everything. It, and, you know, it's good stuff against Stonescar and Rakano. It's always nice to have that kind of stuff happening uh, just because, like, I like seeing the meta slow down a little bit. I like seeing shenanigans. This is a card that enables more shenanigans and is going to create create some interesting situations. It's perfectly beatable. Three damage is the thing that you, you know, generally try to plan against. You want to be above Torch. Now you want to be above Torch and Hailstorm. So getting there is going to be pretty good, and uh, I think that it's actually a fairly solid setup if you can get that done. Uh, this does not prevent, like... So you can still die to like more go-wide strategies, like more focus strategies, or doing a lot more burn, but this is a card that is actually going to be very meaningful in the meta, and should actually have a pretty huge impact on Primal in its effort to slow down things and basically set up, so set themselves up for the, the long game. So you can play this with Lightning Storm if you want to, and if you feel that the aggro meta is that meaningful. Uh, I don't recommend it, but it is going to be okay in probably the first part of the month and the last part of the month when people are trying to play really really aggressive decks all the time um and like overall i think it's just going to fit super well in ranked uh you're gonna love this card as far as just primal decks go there's not gonna be a lot of reason not to play it and i think it's heavily pushed so yes play this card it's great it's well worth using and uh the weaknesses that it has which are basically large units sort of mid-range stuff are things that you can cover elsewhere with things like polymorph and trying to fiddle around with sort of like the the bigger type stuff is going to be now the major issue for primal but you no longer have to focus on two different axes you have the anti-aggro tools that you need to get yourself onto the point where you can establish some interesting stuff in terms of finishing and also killing mid-range units so yeah super strong card good stuff for primal we're all for it the other card that is uh released it's not going to be nearly as impactful but is very interesting and that is sandglass juggernaut which <sighs> so 
So there was an official spoiler page for the last couple of things, but they, they don't, didn't do it this time around, and so we got different quality images. Uh, this is my plea. Official spoiler page, please, so that I don't have to resize the images and so I get the high quality images for everything. In any case, sand glass juggernaut. Okay, so this guy is 5 cost for double red, double yellow, 6-1 reckless, invulnerable to damage, and when you summon it, exhaust it. Which, uh, in case you're wondering, that basically just means that you can't give it charge, which is somewhat relevant. There are, there are some reasons that you'd really want this to have charge, uh, and a couple of ways to give it Centaur, Raid Leader, and Accelerate, but uh, that's probably not too big of a deal. You also can't give it Killer, which is a little more relevant and can be actually a bit of an issue. Sounds like there is one more coming up on the Discord, and we had the name just spoiled for it, so we might draw this one out uh, as we wait for Scarmatch to spoil the last one, and I'll have Pojo's initial reaction to it, or we could just wait for a little bit <laughs> in any case. So, uh, yeah, so, yes, we've got Sandglass Juggernaut. So, uh, invulnerability to damage is actually very, very powerful. It is a strong ability against any type of red deck. It is something that uh, happens to answer Hailstorm very well. Um... This is nonetheless, like, kind of exciting. Like, I think that there is just a lot of cool things that you can do with it. Uh, well, actually, it does basically one thing. It attacks in for damage every turn. This is very similar, in fact, to the card um, Flamestoker, which is another card that generates sort of a single consistent attacker that has some sort of ability and is very, very hard to answer. Sandglass, Juggernaut, and Flamestoker operate in very similar spaces. Uh, there is differences. One is that Sandglass, Juggernaut is faster, but does not have the overwhelm. Uh, but two is that you get the ability to, like, sort of, uh, you get to actually, like, push a little bit. You, you are you're more vulnerable to removal, such as, like, Death Strike, Feeding Time, that kind of stuff. Uh, and less vulnerable, of course, to Attachment removal. But I consider these two to be in very similar spaces as far as things go. Um, notably, you can, of course, give this card Endurance, uh, Infinite Hourglass, and Mysterium Orb both offer that, op that ability. I believe that if a card is going to exhaust itself, it will exhaust itself, but it doesn't actually matter because Sandglass Juggernaut will then unexhaust at the start of the next turn. So whether or not it exhausts itself is uh, a question that could be answered, but I don't think it actually matters because it will be ready on your turn if you have Endurance on it. Uh, beyond that, invulnerability to damage is a really interesting ability. Uh, the 7-7 seven, seven dinosaur that had it is not very strong, and I don't know that Sandglass Juggernaut is all that strong either. I think it is fast, it is inevitable, and it does offer quite a bit in terms of like just cool things that you can do with it, but I'm not sure if it has any crazy Johnny potential just yet. Uh, there may be some cool things that we can do with this card. I don't know about anything crazy at the moment. It seems like it's mostly just going to offer a sort of powerful attacker and a pretty good sentinel exhaustion type deck because it is a 5 cost with 6 attack, so you can actually give you some uh, extra strength so that you can actually, you know, like it just has a lot more kick to it from a 5 cost unit than most other units for sentinel bond type decks. And we've actually seen some Praxis aggro decks out there that uh, run this combined with the Bond Sentinel, uh, the 5-3 charge, and can get like a ton of stuff out very, very quickly. So filling in the slots there, this adds more stuff to the Explorer Sentinel archetypes. Uh, it benefits from the artifact that gives Sentinels plus two strength. It benefits from the Explorer setup that gives Explorers plus one plus one with Dig Sight. Uh, there's a lot of things where you like just having more Sentinels gives you a couple more interesting toolkits. And I think it's uh, reasonably good at fitting into those decks. So yeah, it might see a little bit of play. There are some five cost Sentinels already and some of them are pretty good. So I don't know if this is like a super strong card, but I can see it be seeing some play in ranked and actually getting a little bit of a uh, gas to it. All right. All right, and to wrap it up, we have Lothry Sky Strider. Uh, four cost, two, two. When Lothry Sky Strider attacks, your attacking elves get flying this turn. And if you have an elf ally, draw a spell from the top four cards of your deck and discard the rest. Okay, this is an interesting one. I'm not sure if there are a high quality of a high quantity of strong elves. The strongest one to note is, of course, Champion of Cunning. 
which is just a crazy one. Uh, there are some other pretty okay ones. There's Lothrai Infiltrator. There's uh, basically anything with Lothrai in the name. You can usually get a little bit of elfiness out of that one. Um, Elf is one of the least important factions at the moment, but there are plenty of them, and there are quite a few in, uh, you know, like the, the whole, like, sort of uh, haunting screams type, type setup. So, yeah, it's not unreasonable to say that you could actually build some elf tri tribal out of Lothrai Sky Strider. Uh, nonetheless, the elf ally is the most important thing here, and I'd say that in any sort of like film type control deck, you can certainly do cool things. Uh, people are noting that Rindra is a an elf, Ashara is an elf, and Beast Color is an elf. Yeah, those are... No, Rindra is an unseen. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, but Ashara and Beast Color are both uh, elves, yes. Any Lothrai cards are, and uh, Ashara's of both stripes are in fact elves. In fact, we can just, we can just do the search for elf here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Direwood Beast Color, Ashara, Amethyst Acolyte, Lothrai Nightblade, Ashara the Deadshot, uh, and Champion of Cunning are the major ones. So, eh, just a bunch of film setups. There's not a lot of elves, but there are some out there, and a few that you can play with. So, yeah, this card will work out pretty okay in any sort of Haunting Scream type deck. It is that uh, crucial four-cost card, so I think it plays particularly well in just the Rindra deck. Like, if that deck is missing any sort of win rate, then that's sort of where this card goes, because it's actually very powerful there. It gives all of your attacking elves flying, which is uh, sort of a big deal. It means something for Ashara, it means something for Lothrai Ranger, it means something for Dire with Beast Caller. Um, but... Uh, on its own, I'm not sure if it's actually a terribly strong card. I do like the Elf Ally ability. I think that it works very well with Haunting Scream. Uh, I think that's like the sole deck that it currently belongs in. But I think it can go in other things as more and more Elves are released, and it might have some potential in pretty much anything that's just straight Felm. I don't see it splashing outside of its colors very often, but uh, uh, I'm more or less into it. The card does replace itself with a spell, which is actually a really good thing. Attaching a scheme to a card is actually very powerful, and uh, being able to just give itself flying is a pretty good deal. So this is always a flyer when attacking. That's not too bad. It's fairly low on stats, so it kind of has to do a lot, but with the uh, Felm decks, you usually can just sort of knock all of the blockers out of the way, and then using the Thry Sky, Sky Strider's Elf Ally ability, you will generally be able to keep a card advantage over your opponents and do some stuff with that. So yeah, this is probably the lowest power of the three that we've seen so far, but uh, it does have some strength in the Scream deck, and I think that it's, it's okay as a niche card there. <laughs> All right, uh, welcome back, guys. Uh, we have we have one more spoiler for tonight, and uh, looks like uh, we got an official spoiler for our stream right at the end of it. Uh, so we are going to be going ahead and talking about one last card, and uh, it is a Yeti card, and it is kind of an interesting one. It's doing some cool, cool stuff, and I just forgot to save the image, so I'll go ahead and do that now. Uh, this guy's name is Pock Pock. The Rock Packer. Or just Pock Pock Rock Packer, rather. He's a 1 5 reckless bond, and when you bond him, create and draw a snowball. Now, this is a really interesting card because it is, I think, the cheapest bond creature that we currently have access to, and it's really interesting to see bond creatures at small amounts because that allows you to add a lot of stats to the board very very quickly and sort of create a lot of pressure on the board in uh, a very short period of time. So for example some of the things that you can do here is you can play a Snowcrust Yeti on turn one and then on turn two for one power you can play Pock Pock along with another Snowcrust Yeti. On turn two you can also do something like play the 3-1 Overwhelm Scout Yeti and immediately play Pock Pock on top of it without ever having to create a blocker. So Pock Pock is going to be pretty low impact on your overall aggro, but actually allows you to push out a 1-5 very, very quickly. The Reckless ability means that he's not a terribly useful unit on defense, but he does hold your, hold your opponent at bay for one turn, and then continue to sort of like ping in and be kind of aggressive and utilize that like small amount of damage early on. 
So this is a really weird card because it adds a lot of stats to the board, but it isn't capable of really taking advantage of those stats in a way that you would normally be able to do cool things with. So it functions in like the kind of weird, fun way that Yeti Aggro wants to work, in that it is really efficient, but also not efficient at all. So we are, we're doing just crazy things with it, and you can actually do some really unusual stuff. Pock Pock is the kind of thing that you could throw out in like weird mixes of Yetis with like Shard of the Spire and Accelerated Impact. Pock Pock is a card that you could definitely buff up with weapons and have a lot of fun with that way. He's a card that benefits well from other Yeti buffs, including Lump Party Starter. Um, he generally just has like a pile of interesting things going on with him. Uh, but the most important thing here is that you actually get to create and draw a snowball on top of that, which as far as things go is actually quite good. If you're playing with yetis that grant spell damage, specifically Iceberg Warchief, then having extra snowball aggro is actually quite good. You can play this with the Yeti Snowslinger, you can play this with Jotun Hurler, you can play this with, of course, Pock Pock himself. That gives you at least three ways to generate snowballs, and then you can run things like Cloud Snake Harrier and Iceberg Warchief, and basically just get like three to four to five damage snowballs to knock your opponent on the head with. This card also works out just fine with the Yeti card Snow Pelting, which uh, exhausts Yetis to deal extra damage. Pock Pock is always a willing body for that card because he's not really all that interested in attacking in in most, in most scenarios, so he will be there on the field to make Yeti snow pelting uh, quite a lot better, and that's mean that, that means that he's actually doing quite a lot of fun. Uh, he is putting a rock in a snowball. I think it's well established that Yeti like to put rocks in their snowballs, and Pock Pock is apparently the expert in this particular setup. <laughs> um, so, yeah, like, I am pretty down with this card. As far as aggro goes, it is actually probably pretty good, but it does aggro in a way that makes it very unique, and it really kind of sets up, like, Skycrag Yetis in a way that you can kind of take advantage of and do some really interesting things with. Uh, I think uh, this card has some really cool, crazy stuff going on. He's definitely made with Iceberg Warchief in mind because, of course, you can get that extra attack bonus, the plus two damage from Iceberg Warchief, and you can get the snowball damage bonus from Iceberg Warchief. And uh, he's good for holding weapons, as I've said. He's good for flipping things around. He's good for all sorts of weird, crazy stuff. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, you can certainly use Pock Pock as a way to splash Yetis into other colors. I'm kind of interested to see how the card holds up with, like, killer effects, with, uh, any sort of, like, benefits from all sorts of interesting types of attacks. You can give him the, uh, 1-1 one, one quick draw weapon that uh, draws a card every time that you hit your opponent, and feel pretty okay about that. You can give him any type of, uh, attack benefit setups and actually do pretty okay. Pock Pock also like allows you to play much more of the spell list type of decks that you want to play with like uh, the Jotun Frostheart or uh, Jeral Frostkin. <laughs> like if you want to just play like a pile of snowballs and Jeral Frostkin, this is one way that you can actually do that. Um, <laughs> because now you have access to a critical amount of snowballs, and that's just that's just fun times. Who doesn't love that? Um, what else is going on with Pock Pock? I think that at the moment it's a little hard to evaluate just because he is a card that is uh, just kind of crazy as far as things go, but he does do some some interesting stuff. And yeah, people are mentioning that it's not just a Geralt Ice Art, you can also do Island Combo, uh, that kind of like situation where you throw Eileen on the field, throw a snowball, and then immediately transition into a Decimate or a Channel the Tempest. And uh, Eileen and Geralt do have a lot of overlap in that deck. So if you want to do a crazy Johnny deck with Pock Pock, there are some cool options available. But overall, I think that he does actually support the aggro strategy, and there are some cool ways that you can make that happen. Uh, you do have to figure out ways to get Pock Pock to get extra attack, because if he's just attacking on his own, even if you have the extra bond out, he is costing you a card slot that you would otherwise be devoting to something like Cinder Yeti or some sort of more aggressive Yeti, maybe like a Vadius or some other three drop that could actually be very, very scary. So while he will create more early game pressure, he doesn't create more late game pressure unless you are including weapons to put on top of him. Pock Pock works really well with Shogun's Scepter. I think that in that situation, he's actually really, really solid. He's good with Ornate Katana. He 
loves holding ornate katanas and he can be played in any type of like interesting doorbot style aggro where you are just dropping weapons on things. You can look to LSV's Yeti list from the previous uh, event that we talked about uh, to sort of get an idea of where Pock Pock might belong. Uh, LSV's deck was a pretty solid Yeti list that actually shows sort of some of the ways that you can utilize Yetis and a couple of different paths that you can take. And focusing down on any one particular path with Pock Pock is going to get you a pretty fun time. Um, but yeah, like... I, I'm really appreciative of the design of Yetis in Eternal. I think that they they put a fun spin on aggro, and they make it so that aggro is like a really interesting and cool mechanic that you can actually play around with in a lot of interesting ways. So despite there being three different types of like really distinct aggro decks, the Rakano, the Stonescar, and the Skycrag, and uh, of course there's one other uh you can do praxis type aggro but that's not explorer aggro is also a very different uh type setup we'll, we'll be talking more about that later but like it's really cool that they are so distinct in different ways and that we have this kind of cool yeti tribal thing yeti tribal is just really fascinating and i i, I think we could talk a lot more about how the design of it is just kind of full of interesting like little quirks it is combo, but not quite combo. It is aggressive in really interesting and reliable ways. There's lots of synergies that also do things that are not inherently powerful for synergies, but like very, very good on average and very good on aggregate. And that's that's cool stuff. I'm excited about Pock Pock. I'm excited about what he brings to the table. I'm really excited to see those Pock Pock Yeti decks. I'm probably not that excited to play against them because uh, aggro decks are just, uh, yeah, you know, it's just always uh, getting swarmed by things can be really ridiculous. Uh, but I'm sure that I'll be laughing every time that the guy knocks my head in. So uh, yeah, lots and lots of snowballs with rocks in them coming your way. And maybe we can see some really cool snowball tribal decks where we are actually playing with cloud snakes and war chiefs and awesome awesome stuff like that this is a fun card this is a funny card this is a really fun design uh i'm super down with it and with that uh we're gonna go ahead and close it out so that's it for the eternal spoiler breakdown uh thank you guys so much for watching feel free to like or subscribe if you liked this video there's a notification bell if you want to get notified when i post up new stuff including eternal basics eternal brews and more spoiler breakdowns which i'm sure we'll have more of uh have a really good night everyone may your days be merry and bright and full of cheer and may your snowballs always come without rocks in them thanks so much for watching cheers